All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida. So a quick note for our internet audience watching at home. If at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of tonight's book, you can call the number on your screen. We'll take care of that for you. We'll get it signed, and we will ship it to wherever you are in the United States free of charge. This evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome back Mr. Roger Stone, presenting his new book, Nixon's Secrets. Mr. Stone was the youngest member of the Nixon staff in 1972 and was credited with Nixon's rehabilitation in his post-presidential years. He has been a Washington insider for the last 40 years, and he played a key role in the election of Republican Presidents Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush. His previous book, The Man Who Killed Kennedy, was the second best-selling book related to the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's murder. In this book, Mr. Stone offers us an insider's look at a variety of compelling episodes in Richard Nixon's history, including the 1960 election, Watergate, and his pardon by President Gerald Ford. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Roger Stone. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me say, uh, I love books and books. I could just I could spend hours looking at the stock here, and it's uh, it's just a very special place for me, because uh, actually history was made in this very room. The night that uh, I spoke here on my uh, book, The Man Who Killed Kennedy: The Case Against uh, LBJ, was the night that C-SPAN filmed an hour presentation, including the Q&A, and then put it up, uh, you know, in real time. Uh, and it really it helped catapult that book to the New York Times bestseller list, which was an accomplishment in that, unfortunately, there are those in the mainstream media who are not open to the idea of any alternative history other than the one told us by the federal government, which, let's face it, now has a record of lying to the American people over a long-term period of time, whether they lied about the war in Vietnam or whether they are lying about Obamacare or whether they are lying about IRS records or... And it's, and it's bipartisan. I mean, this is not even a partisan screed. The, under both Republicans and Democrats, I think in many cases, that people have been disserved by the narrative of history fed to us by the, uh, by the government. So um, it was a, I, I was very proud of uh, the man who killed Kennedy, the case against LBJ. Uh, and it is now out in paperback, uh, which hopefully we have some of uh, with us tonight, with two new chapters and an update which make the case that Lyndon Johnson was the most amoral, uh, greedy, corrupt, sadistic, mentally unbalanced uh, individual to ever fill the presidency. I mean, in all honesty, you can be harshly critical of Richard Nixon and Barack Obama and all of our presidents, but I, I would submit to you, based on the record I compiled, that this man had a depravity that is uh, shocking somebody who fathered three illegitimate children while either vice president or president, someone who impregnated five different women on the White House secretarial pool. This is someone who lived like a pasha. Uh, and uh, his, help, his close friend, J. Edgar Hoover, whose funding Johnson had quadrupled as Senate Majority Leader, also his next door neighbor, uh, a man who attended the victory celebration when Lyndon Johnson stole his election in 1948. Mr. Hoover, the FBI director, flew all the way to Texas for his friend Lyndon give you some instance, um, you know, that have, uh, I think, uh, corrupted the history of that period. So I'm very, I'm very grateful for the reception that book that got. This book, by the way, I was reading the newspaper on the way down here. It is, it's amazing what you read. I read that these Hasidic Jews in Brooklyn were arrested with 50 pounds of weed. I guess it was for the high holidays. Uh, it is... Uh, I, I also read that, that Governor Chris Christie was coming to campaign for Governor Rick Scott. Who thought that was a good idea? Uh, so uh, what I do want to focus on really is uh, the subject at hand, and that is uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, this book is, uh, is, a, is, in essence, the continuation of a thread of history that begins, uh, really, uh, with Operation 40, which is a uh, CIA mafia plot in the late 1950s uh, under the Eisenhower administration that was honchoed by Vice President Richard Nixon 
uh, which was uh, designed to enlist uh, assassins from the CIA with informants from the mafia to infiltrate Cuba and assassinate Castro. This was, this was Vice President Nixon's October surprise. He was hoping this would happen just before the 1960 election, vaulting him ahead of the better funded John Kennedy. For a number of reasons, uh, and of course, the federal government's involvement with the mob was a deeply held secret. Well, unfortunately, that, the assassination attempts didn't happen. That became the Bay of Pigs invasion, which became not only the assassination of Castro in the planning, but also a, an amphibious landing uh, uh, on the, at the Bay of Pigs. Uh, that, in turn, in my view, is connected to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. It is not coincidental that the men on the ground in Dealey Plaza on December 22, 1963, are the same men, four of them, who break into the Watergate, all of whom were involved in the planning of the Bay of Pigs. So I've tried to create one thread of history and then follow the careers of Richard Nixon, John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and try to put, uh, and try to give some feel for how politics in those days was, was practiced. Uh, I had the honor of knowing Richard Nixon. We became very good friends, intimate friends, late in his post-presidency. In 1972, I was the youngest member of the staff of the committee to re-elect the president. I uh, worked as a volunteer in the 1968 campaign. I became the protege of John Davis Lodge, who was uh, the governor of Connecticut, also a movie star, ambassador to Spain and France. He was the very, he was the swashbuckling, good-looking, older brother of Henry Cabot Lodge, the U.S. Senator from Massachusetts. Uh, and he, uh, after I worked for him in the 68 campaign, really as a driver, gopher, he wrote a letter of introduction to me for the Nixon White House, and I became an intern working low down in the press shop uh, under Patrick Buchanan, but Mr. Buchanan was so much higher at that point that I rarely saw him. And my job was clipping up newspaper clippings, and I would paste them down, and then they'd be copied, and they'd be sent to the president. So I had to get up go to Union Station, buy the Chicago paper, buy the New York papers, buy the, all the other papers, get them back to the White House, cut them up, paste them down, copy them, and give them to my boss, and then I had to go out and distribute them to various people, the most important people in the, in the entourage. That was my first job. Well, one of the people I had to send them to was Jeb Magruder of the committee re elected the president, was a good-looking kind of stand-in who was a protege of the White House chief of staff, John, uh, Bob Haldeman, who was running the president's re-election, at least it, uh, until John Mitchell, the attorney general, could resign to take the helm, which was the plan. Uh, so I so completely brown-nosed Magruder that they gave me a job. Uh, and I was 19 years old, and of course he was happy because I later learned that the scheduler's job they hired me for had a budget allotted of 37000 a year, and he could hire me uh, basically in college for twenty-two. So I shifted my classes to the evening, was working for the committee to re-elect the president. I didn't really become uh, friendly with President Nixon on an intimate basis until, 19, until the, his post-presidential period. 1977, I was elected young Republican national chairman, and he invited me to San Clemente. And it was, it was supposed to be a 15-minute grip and grin. It became a four-hour discussion of politics. He kind of warmed up. We were talking, this was 1979, about who would be president. He told me he thought Governor John Connolly would be the Republican nominee. And I said, well, Mr. President, with all due respect, I think you're wrong about that. It will be Ronald Reagan. He, I guess he thought that was kind of audacious since he'd known Reagan for 50 years and, uh, or longer at that point. Uh, but um, we became friends, and I began doing errands for him, vetting, in, uh, vetting um, invitations, sending messages, uh, carrying memos to Presidents Bush and Presidents Clinton, uh, he traveled very widely, was very prolific. He wrote 10 bestsellers on foreign policy in his post-election days. So I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with him. Now, this book is not in any way a whitewash or a rehabilitation of Richard Nixon. I say some shocking things about him. Uh, as, as much as I have enormous affection for him, I've tried to write a warts and all biography that tells you how politics was practiced in the 50s. So, for example, I will tell you Richard Nixon's early career was definitely funded with, funded with mob money. So was John Kennedy's. So was Lyndon Johnson's. So was Harry Truman's. So was Adlai Stevenson. There was no campaign finance laws in 19, 
50s and 60s, everything was done in cash, and the mob were players. And the fact the mob was entwined with the democratic machine in most of the big cities, like Chicago. We'll return to that in a moment. Uh, people don't realize that Nixon's rise from the, his first term in the House in 1946 to the vice presidency is only a span of six years. I mean, that is a meteoric rise, and Nixon used those years to try to establish foreign policy credentials, taking the opportunity to travel as widely as possible, and in many cases meeting with the presidents, and more importantly in some cases the vice presidents of other nations, who by the time Nixon became president or vice president were now presidents of their country. And this foreign policy expertise becomes his ace card throughout his career. It is his largest argument for election in 1960, uh, it is what allows him to achieve the historic opening to China, the end of the war in Vietnam, the SALT agreements for arms control with the Soviets. It is what he uses to rehabilitate himself after the, the ashes and the disaster of Watergate and the pardon. Uh, and I'll, we'll talk about how he, in the end of his career, becomes a valued foreign policy advisor for President Bill Clinton. But my book is neither a... a, a, uh, a, a uh, Whitewash for Nixon, nor is it an excoriation. I tell you what I think is missing, the good with the bad. This is a man who is both uh, very brilliant uh, and very paranoid. This is someone who's both very visionary and very petty. This is somebody who's both very bold and very hesitant. This is someone who's very confident uh, and, and very uh, 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 plagued by demons. This is a, a very complex and therefore compelling man, and his story is a Greek tragedy, which is why I seek to, sell it, to tell it. But I knew at the 40th anniversary there would be a spate of books about Nixon and the Nixon years, and I think that the great tragedy here is that the great accomplishments of Richard Nixon get lost in the ashes of Watergate. This is a man who opened the door to China. Let's start from the beginning. This is a man who ended the Kennedy-Johnson war in Vietnam. Yes, he increased the bombing to give a cover to withdraw our troops and get them home, which he did. He gets no credit for this. He overruled the Pentagon. He overruled his own Defense Department. He got American boys out of harm's way because it was clear to him that there was not going to be a success the way we were conducting the war. It is not his fault that South Vietnam fell because the second part of the Nixon proposal was to fund the South Vietnamese after we left, and we failed to do that, and they fell. This is a man who opened the door to China over the objections of his own government. In 1969, it is Nixon who tells Kissinger, I think I'm going to go to China, and Nixon says, uh, Kissinger says, this can be heard in the tapes, you're crazy. This is a man who then used the China card to squeeze deep arms concessions out of the Soviets, saving this country hundreds of millions of dollars. The Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Environmental Protection Agency. In those days, we had no environmental protection. Yes, I agree, those things have gone too far in the age of big government, but the idea itself of minimal environmental protection, to have clean water and clean air, no, I think that was a good thing. Ending the military draft, the 18-year-old vote, the war on cancer, federal revenue sharing, desegregating the schools in the South without violence or bloodshed. When Nixon became president, 15% of the schools in the South were desegregated. When he left, 87 percent. You can talk about the Southern strategy all you want. If the Southern strategy meant I'm going to go slow, going slow worked. Nobody got killed and the schools were desegregated. But unfortunately, when you say Richard Nixon, people talk about Watergate. And therefore, I think Watergate has to be put in some perspective. To do that, we have to look at Nixon's 1960 campaign for president. There's a great book, a seminal book, a book that they probably even still sell here at Books and Books called The Making of the President, 1960. It's a romantic tale. Teddy White, the man who wrote it, a Pulitzer Prize winner, was a good friend of mine. He was a great drinking companion, but he was enthralled with the Kennedy mystique. Jack Kennedy, the dashing, charming, intellectual, sophisticate, versus, versus this boob from uh, California uh, who stands for the the center of the country, the flyover states. Uh, in, in his telling, Kennedy wears the white hat and Nixon is the black-headed villain, but I'm here to tell you that's not how that campaign unfolded. Now, it is absolutely true that Nixon uh, and Kennedy started in all the polling, you can see uh, in the uh, appendix of my book, Nixon's Secrets, 
that the polls were always had this race close from the beginning. So there was never any presumption for Nixon. In fact, the party had taken a whomping in 1958. It held the lowest number of governors and the lowest number of members of both houses that it had since the 20s. Uh, so they had very lit less, substantially less grassroots activity. Uh, Nixon always ran ahead of the party and therefore was more than competitive with all the Democrats. He underestimated Kennedy. In the beginning of that campaign, he made several huge mistakes. The first one was a mistake, it was a pledge to visit all 50 states. Now the reason he did this was because his candidacy had a dilemma that the Kennedy-Johnson ticket did not have. They could run both as, uh, they ran as both advocates and opponents of civil rights. John Kennedy traveled the country saying, I'm for civil rights for black people. And his running mate, Lyndon Johnson, lifelong segregationist, followed behind him and said, don't worry folks, he's only kidding to the courthouse crowd, to the old Southern Democrats, to the crackers, to the segregationists. And indeed, the Kennedy-Johnson ticket held the Deep South. There was no Republican incursions into the Deep South because of this ability to play race both ways. Nixon had, didn't have that luxury. He either had to make a decision about seeking black votes in the Northeast, in Northeast industrial states of New York and Pennsylvania and, and uh, uh, Michigan and Ohio, in California, or to try to make the first historic Republican in concursions into what was called the Solid South. Does he make a play for Georgia? He went to Atlanta, and they had the largest crowd that's ever visited a presidential candidate at the, at the uh, airport. He was encouraged. So instead, he makes a pledge to try to do both, which is an enormous mistake, because it means that he has to spend his time flying to Alaska and Wyoming and Vermont, states that he has completely locked up. Kennedy, meanwhile, is barnstorming in the big 10 states and never leaving them. He doesn't need to go to Massachusetts and Rhode Island. He's got them locked up. Then uh, he compounds this mistake by knocking his knee on a car door right after Labor Day. His, car, his knee becomes infected. Uh, he's hospitalized for two weeks at Walter Reed's hospital post Labor Day. And he sees Kennedy pulling out to a lead in the polls. Uh, he comes roaring out of the hospital against his doctor's advice. He is still on antibiotics. He's still running a fever, and he's 15 pounds underweight. He, he hits five states on the way to Chicago for rallies, furiously trying to make up ground on his way to Chicago for the debate. John Kennedy, he arrived early in the day, and he spent the, the entire day on the roof with two hookers getting a suntan. Nixon made the classic mistake of thinking that substance was more important than your appearance and that what you had to say was more important than, than how you presented it. Uh, Nixon uh, therefore goes to uh, the lighting check, which is kind of like a, uh, a weigh-in. And the CBS technician comes up to Senator Kennedy. Nixon writes in his memoirs, he looked like a bronzed god. I'd never seen Kennedy looking so fit. The makeup man walks up and says, Senator Kennedy, will you be having makeup? No, no makeup for me. Nixon hears this. Now the CBS makeup man says, Mr. Uh, Mr. Vice President, will you be having makeup? No, no makeup for me. Whereupon Kennedy goes to his private dressing room where his personal makeup man makes him up. <laughs> Nixon goes to his dressing room. His TV advisors say, you look terrible on TV. You need makeup. He says, no. Kennedy's not going with makeup. They'll say, I had makeup. He didn't have makeup. I'm not having makeup totally fakes him out. They convince Nixon, at a minimum, to use a product called Beard Stick, which is meant to conceal the five o'clock shadow, which was problematic for Nixon. Well, unfortunately, halfway through the debate and under pressure, Nixon, underweight, with a collar too big, as gray as the color of the wrong suit that he chose, Nixon's we uh, Kennedy's wearing navy blue and a white shirt and a dark tie for television. They say Nixon's complexion is almost as gray as his suit. In the middle of the debate, he starts to sweat, and the beard stick starts running down his face. Uh, the debate is so damaging that Nixon's own mother calls his private secretary, uh, Rosemary Woods, immediately after the debate, and says, is Richard unwell? Mayor Daley says to a crony, Jesus Christ, he's not even dead yet, and they've embalmed him already. <laughs> Here's what they don't tell you. There wasn't one debate, there were four debates. So Nixon went on a regimen of milkshakes, and he got a sun lamp. And he bounced back big in debates two and three. Now, some uh, argue, well, the, the size of the television audience wasn't as great for debates two and three. There was a huge drop-off, and they're correct. 
But here's the part they don't tell you. Debate four, considered Nixon's best debate, only had 100,000 fewer people than the first debate. So Nixon made ground. Secondarily, Nixon had hoarded his money for the last 30 days, where old Joe Kennedy was writing the checks, so they were just spending balls out from the beginning. Kennedy was really out of steam. Nixon outspent Kennedy on television and radio for the last three weeks. And then, frankly, Dwight Eisenhower got off the bench, and he visited Pittsburgh and Philadelphia uh, and La New York City and Los Angeles, and he drew enormous crowds. He called Senator Kennedy Little Boy Blue, a man unprepared to be president. Uh, Nixon really believed that he closed fast in that, in that race. But the other part that Mr. White misses that I think is more interesting is the fact that we now know that Richard Nixon's hotel room was wiretapped on the evening of the second debate at the Ward Sheridan Park by Robert Kennedy. We also know that someone broke into Nixon's psychiatrist's office and stole his medical records. And we know that somebody broke into Nixon's accountant's office in Los Angeles to steal his financial records. We know that men working for Robert Kennedy wiretapped the Republican National Committee in 1960. This is 12 years before Watergate, folks. So this airbrushed narrative of the Kennedys is good guys. Robert Kennedy played very rough. John, uh, Ambassador Kennedy paid a, an informant $200,000 for a copy of Nixon's financials because he was a, a, he was a disgruntled accountant and he had access. These, these were very tough people. Uh, there's no question that, that, uh, that, uh, that Ambassador Kennedy makes a deal with, Car with the Sam G. and Con and the Chicago mob, and they deliver. So uh, I talk a lot about the 1960 election, but the, the simple truth is when Nixon got to California late at night and spent, he thought he had won. That's because he had, and this election was stolen from him. The momentum in the end, the trajectory of this race was a victory for Nixon. He was on, he was on the rebound. So if you look at the wards of Chicago, you will see rampant theft by the daily machine with a little help from the mob. Now, some such as, um, a professor who I've quoted in here, or his name I believe is Kelleher, argues that just changing Illinois wouldn't have changed the outcome of the 1960 election. Kennedy would still have been elected. That's true, but it ignores the real voter threat in Texas, where Lyndon Johnson is counting the votes. So let me tell you how the Texas ballot works. There's a paper ballot. There are 10 candidates for president, including the independents and the vegetarians and the two top tickets. You're supposed to cross off the names of those you are not for and leave the name you are for untouched. That's the way to vote legally. If you circle Nixon and Lodge, and Lyndon Johnson's doing the counting in that county, out. 56,000 of those were thrown out in Dallas County and burned within the hour. Lyndon Johnson leaves no evidence when he steals votes. So, and there is no recount law in Texas. So yes, Richard Nixon was robbed. Now. For those who say to me, well, you, you like Nixon, you knew Nixon, Nixon was paranoid, you'd be paranoid too if a millionaire gangster and his lightweight son, who never wrote a speech that he read in his life and didn't write his book, Profiles in Courage, and was handed everything in his life by his wealthy, corrupt, Nazi-loving father, had cheated you out of the president, I, presidency, I think you would be paranoid too. They wiretapped Nixon again in 1962 when he ran for governor in California. You can hear him say it in the White House tapes. Hell, everybody wiretaps everybody. We know that. Lyndon Johnson wiretapped Nixon's campaign plane in 1968. Folks, it's the way the game was played. But to, uh, to try to understand Watergate is difficult. At the time that the Watergate burglars break into the, the Democratic National Committee, Nixon is running 19 points ahead of McGovern. He's on his way to a 49-state blowout. I think it's very important to understand that there's something else going on in the administration. Nixon becomes president with a reputation as the hardest line anti-communist. Army intelligence, the Joint Chiefs, the CIA, they think they're going to be unfettered in Vietnam, which it says a lot when you look at the way Johnson escalated the war. And therefore, the rapid withdrawal of our troops is bitterly opposed by the defense establishment and the Central Intelligence Agency. The opening to China is offensive to them because Nixon uses Kissinger, who talks directly to them, to go around the CIA so they don't know they're ta he's talking to the Chinese to stop them from 
undermining him. This is why he is a master of foreign policy. Uh, they are really upset about the arms reductions assault agreements where they think Nixon gave away the store. So as early as 1969, the military begins spying on Nixon. A, a uh, naval yeoman named Radford is copying documents, going through files, desks, burn bags, even Henry Kissinger's briefcase, and sending the stuff right to the head of the Joint Chiefs. In fact, I reveal in my book that the CIA is so opposed to Nixon and his policies and the fact that he continues to press for the records to the Kennedy assassination and the Bay of Pigs because he also knows that they are connected. That the Central Intelligence Agency mounts two attempts to assassinate Nixon here in Miami. The first one on Key Biscayne where the plan is to infiltrate a Vietnam Veterans Against the War event and to kill Nixon with a shoulder launched rocket while he's sitting in his living room. This plan is aborted. Then, uh, Frank Sturgis, one of the Watergate burglars, uh, enlists a contract gunman who's given a gun and told that they are going to shoot Nixon outside of Vietnam Veterans for the War uh, uh, convention when he comes to speech. They're supposed to shoot him as he goes to leave, hiding behind some anti-war demonstrators. This plot falls apart when, Kaiser's, when Kaiser learns that the target is the President of the United States. He declines and the plot collapses. I will show you in my book that later it is the CIA who infiltrates the Watergate break-in term and sabotages the break-in as the way to take Nixon down. Why? They are against detente. They are against peace policies. In fact, as soon as Nixon is gone, Henry Kissinger's done. Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney, the Secretary of Defense and his deputy in the Ford administration, they end detente. Henry Kissinger has a title and no more power. This is the beginning of the neocons, the same people who later drive us to war in, uh, in Iraq and so on. So uh, that is part of the story. I mean, there's no question that four of the six Watergate burglars are working for the CIA. They're the same four who are on the ground in the Bay of Pigs. Uh, the truth is that the Watergate explanation that you've been given is a grotesque, uh, and fantastic distortion of historical truth. I mean, I was a little late tonight because I had to find John Dean's book and move it to the fiction section. <laughs> I mean, in all honesty, this book is fraudulent, and I'll tell you why. Mr. Dean tells us he bases his book on 342 transcripts that only he has seen, that he had transcribed. Fair enough. Let a peer historian look at them for accuracy and listen to the tapes. He won't allow that. He'll let no one to see his secret memos. And in this, in this version, he has airbrushed himself out of the narrative. So the tapes of his conversations with Nixon of March 13th, 16th, 17th, and 20th, which showed that he is the Watergate weasel who sucks Nixon into the cover-up and not the other way around, he's airbrushed them out of the picture. They're not in the book. It, it's, it, it, is a, it is a grotesque cover-up job, and, it's, and he has gotten away with it for 40 years. Here are the facts. Mr. Dean ordered the casing of the Watergate six weeks before the break-in. It is in the memoirs of two decorated New York cops, Tony Ulasowicz and Jack Caulfield, both of whom were sent on the mission to case the joint. It is John Dean who tells Jeb Magruder, get a team, tell Liddy to get a team into the Watergate. The Watergate break-in is not in the Liddy Genstone plan. It is added at the suggestion of John Dean, not in the book. So uh, I have uh, had the fortunate uh, experience of having a galley of Mr. Dean's book before it published, and therefore I have written a point-by-point -point, point point rebuttal to his book in my book in the Watergate section for those who are interested in what Watergate was really about. Now, let me say, Again, you can't rehabilitate Nixon. The idea of breaking into the Watergate, as postulated by Liddy and Magruder and Dean, was not about political intelligence. What they really wanted were the records of a call girl ring that was being used by the Democratic National Committee to ar arrange escorts for visiting Democratic dignitaries. And the funny thing about this call girl ring was it was also being used by the Republican National Committee, the White House, and the State Department. It was two blocks from the White House at Columbia Plaza. And in the draw at the Democratic National Committee, a locked draw of a secretary, there was a portfolio where they had pictures of the girls uh, who you could choose to be your companion. 
Uh, I believe that the purpose of the Watergate break-in was to get that portfolio. The reason that they tapped the phone, the phone they tapped was not Larry O'Brien's phone. It was the phone that was used for assinations with the whorehouse, pardon me. John Dean had a Purian interest. And interestingly enough, Mr. Dean has a relationship with a woman who runs the cat house. In fact, his wife, Maureen, may have worked there. Now, I'm not the first one to say this. Two award-winning journalists that found the, the escort service, found the prostitute ring at the Columbia Plaza, J. Anthony Lucas and Anthony Summers. These men are liberals. <laughs> they don't agree with Roger Stone on much, but they confirm the existence. And then in his seminal book, James Haugen, in, in their book, Len Kolodny and Robert Getlin, and now in a new book, John Dean's real role in the existence of the call girl ring is finally revealed. That's why I recommend to you this incredible book because it really bolsters what I have said. It's like a companion. But it's written in a noir style, like a thriller. And it's very sexy, and it's quite good. But it will tell you the truth about what Watergate is about. And Mr. Stanford got the little black book of the woman who ran the house. Secretary of Commerce is in there. Uh, several of the Watergate figures are in there. John Dean is in there. Senator Lowell Weicker is in there. Sam Dash, the White House, the Senate. My uh, Democratic Council on the Watergate Committee is in there. This is an incredible read, and I recommend it. Um, I also, because I think that the, that the coverage needs some balance, and that Nixon needs to be viewed both in view of the huge mistakes that he has made, but also in his accomplishments, I also uh, produced these, which uh, kind of, uh, so that there's an alternative story here that I think that young people need to know. People, young people look at Watergate and they say to me, well, I don't understand, what was this about? It seems like a rather venal crime. I mean, in many ways that's true. Look at it this way. Nixon wiretapped one building, they threw him out. Barack Obama's wiretapping all of us and reading our mail. Nixon was, an uh, article of impeachment against him was that he used the IRS to harass his political enemies. This administration has used the IRS to harass its political enemies. Nixon was missing 18 and a half minutes. We'll talk about that in a second. This administration is missing hundreds of thousands of documents for Obamacare and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the IRS. And I'm not here to make a partisan agreement because the Republicans under the Bushes were no better when they were there. So uh, I will take questions. We can get into Watergate, deep throw anything that you would like to ask. Uh, I'm open to talk about the Johnson book, talk about this book, but I appreciate your being there. And then we will move on to some serious book signing. Yes, sir. What document do you have to suggest that the CIA was attempting to assassinate Nixon? Well, let's see. There's the uh, memo from J. Edgar Hoover that uh, tells President Johnson about a KGB report that reached that conclusion. There's a French intelligence document that was uh, essentially commissioned by Jacqueline Kennedy that reached that conclusion. Uh, Senator Barry Goldwater is on the record as saying, uh, uh, well, I, sir, have you read my book? I have not. Well, I would urge you to read the book because it's very hard to have this conversation. My book is not just a book of conjecture. There's 40 pages of end notes and sources. Uh, there's no, let's talk about the CIA's uh, motive. One, the Bay of Pigs where they blamed Kennedy, and Kennedy said he would smash them to pieces. But more importantly, the Cuban Missile Crisis, where Jack and Bobby got snookered by Kennedy, and we weren't told for 40 years that our missiles were removed from Turkey and Italy in a secret Boston-style political deal that was not told to the American people until 40 years afterwards. Do you think that might give the CIA and the military guys some motive? Or the fact that John Kennedy was a methamphetamine addict? Read Max Jacobson, read Dr. Feelgood out right now, the story of Dr. Max Jacobson, who injects Kennedy just before the 60 debate, injects him three times in Vienna, ostensibly for his back. We know that President Kennedy has to be subdued by Secret Service agents when he gets a, 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 an overdose at the Carlisle Hotel. So as far as the motive of the Defense Intelligence Agency and their morbid fear that Kennedy will give away everything to the communists, that's why I think it is true. Uh, I would urge you to look at the book, and then you can email me, and I'll answer any question. Thank you. Yes, sir. On the cover of your book, it says, what is really on the 18 and a half minute gap? Yes. Could you just hint at that? Then? Yes. Uh, there's two seminal events that I think take Nixon down. The first one is, obviously, the fact that he taped himself. And the tape was, 
self-beginning, meaning that as soon as a question, as soon as he began to speak, it was voice activated. And it's very clear that early on he does not remember that he's taped. Uh, and th the reason I think that Al Haig is the man who makes the 18 and a half minute erasure. Al Haig is uh, Nixon's chief of staff. He is affiliated with the neocons and the hardliners. His lo real loyalty is the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He makes a number of mistakes in Nixon's defense that cannot be a mistake. The most important one is that Haig learns on a Friday that the Senate Watergate Committee has stumbled on the existence of the tapes. He knows that it will be revealed Monday morning. Nixon legally has 48 hours to destroy the tapes before they're subpoenaed, because once they're subpoenaed, their destruction is a crime. But right now, they're Nixon's property. Haig never tells Nixon all weekend. Nixon learns about the tapes on television. The first five minutes of the tapes were, in fact, uh, erased by um, Rosemary Woods, Nixon's secretary. Uh, you can tell because there's a loud hum, which is probably caused by interference from an electrical socket. But then there is a, a, a 13 and a half minute additional two erasures back to back, clearly made in a different location. Now those are made while the tape are in the custody of General Haig. And we know from Bob Woodward's book, which has a lot of fiction in it, that Deep Throat, in this case, Haig, who is not Deep Throat, but a part of a composite of Deep Throat, that Deep Throat tells him on Monday, ask if there's a taping system, there's a deliberate erasure on the tape. So there's the setup. What's on it? That's the interesting thing. Nothing significant. If one goes to Bob Haldeman's handwritten notes contemporaneous with the conversation, there's nothing in there particularly about Watergate. It is the act of the erasure itself that is the setup that causes Nixon's fall. The erasure is the second blow after the existence of all these tapes. Uh, it gets compounded by the firing of the Senate Watergate, uh, pardon me, the Watergate Special Prosecutor, Mr. Cox. Again, Haig, Nixon sends Haig, his chief of staff, General Haig, former deputy to Henry Kissinger, to uh, Attorney General Richardson and says, if the president issues an order to fire Cox, will you, will you fire him? And Richardson says, no, I, would, I disagree that I would have to resign. Haig never tells Nixon. In fact, he tells Nixon the opposite. You can fire Cox and Richardson will stick. So the Saturday Night Massacre is an enormous shock to Nixon. It's probably also the second largest blow. Uh, yes, ma'am. I have a question. You know, Nixon mentioned bringing up the Bay of Pigs. And I have a personal interest. My dad was one of the four American pilots who died there, which my government lied to us and threatened us for years. Yes. The CIA even had a plan to, quote, quiet the daughter's curiosity. What was Nixon wanting to bring up about the Bay of Pigs? Uh, he believed that the same people who were involved in the Bay of Pigs invasion were the same people on the grassy knoll who assassinated the president. That he thought it was a CIA payback. He never liked Helms. He never trusted Helms. He knew all about the Bay of Pigs because Operation 40, his operation, had become the Bay of Pigs, had split into two different fronts, one that still focused on assassination and one that focused on uh, an invasion. Uh, and Bob Haldeman says in his memoirs, when Nixon referred cryptically to the Bay of Pigs, he was speaking to the connection of the JFK assassination. Haldeman's words, not mine. And Haldeman, I think, is Nixon's Boswell in terms of constantly reflecting his views. Yes, sir. Uh, a little bit more about uh, Richard Helms and the CIA. Yes. Why, what would explain the hostility, though, because uh, one of the things that they keep uh, nailing Nixon for, and especially Kissinger for, is uh, having had a, having set the CIA back on a uh, throwback to its glory days in the 1950s, e.g. the coup in Chile. Chile. Yes. So why would, I mean... Be Helms is a political character. Senator Howard Baker put it best. Helms and Nixon had so much on either that neither could breathe. Uh, Senator Baker delves into the CIA fingerprints all over Watergate. It's not Roger Stone saying it. Go to the Senate Watergate Committee. There's an entire appendix about the odd activities of the CIA, who, who destroys all their records about Watergate, even though they've been subpoenaed by the Senate Watergate Committee. Why does the CIA man go to, to Watergate burglar Jim McCord's house and burn his records in the fireplace within hours of he's arrested at the break-in? 
Uh, I mean, the CIA has its fingerprints all over Watergate. And when uh, Senator Baker and Fred Thompson, who was then the counsel to the committee and later a pitch man for reverse mortgages, and a senator and the, uh, and the uh, prosecutor on Law and Order, when he and Baker wanted to look into this, Senator Lowe Weicker voted with the Democrats to end the inquiry, and we never got any deeper into what the CIA knew about Watergate. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Mr. Stone, from your uh, personal experiences with uh, President Nixon, uh, what is your impression of uh, his emotional uh, uh, re re feelings towards the end of the Vietnam War? Uh, I think he makes the... Uh, he figures out that the war is lost. I mean, first of all, he finesses the war in 1968. He never really says he has a secret plan. That is not, cannot be documented, but he sure as hell implies it. He wants to be a peace candidate for the peace voters. He wants to be the hardline candidate. He's been a hardline critic, generally speaking, to Johnson's right and Johnson's conduct of the war, but that's because he needs the Republican nomination and the Republican rank and file party post Goldwater is rabidly anti-communist. So, uh, but he tries to finesse it. it he, he figures out pretty quickly that, that the war is not going to win the way we're waging it, and therefore, against all the advice of the CIA and the Defense Department and Kissinger at that time, Kissinger being a protege of Fritz Kramer, the ultimate hardliner, he wants an accelerated troop withdrawal uh, uh, timetable. They keep saying the South, the South Vietnamese can't make it on their own. Nixon says, well, they're going to have to try. We'll give them money. We'll give them bullets. But... We can't spend any more lives. Yes. Roger, wouldn't you say that going all the, way, all the way back to when Nixon was vice president, he saw this kind of rogue element in the CIA that they would do things without President uh, Eisenhower's knowledge, but they were told to stop various operations by the Kennedys, it just continued. And I think he saw that accelerating all the way through his presidency, and maybe he attempted to, to wrestle more control after, after he was reelected. Well, uh, there's two ways to look at this. Uh, first of all, he liked them fine. He was very close to Alan Dulles when he was vice president, and it looked like their maneuvers would help put him in the White House. Then he realized that, that then they had their face-off with Kennedy, which was bitter. The agency blamed Kennedy for the failure of the bad pigs, and Kennedy blamed the agency. The agency said he didn't send in the air power. Kennedy said, I never agreed to send the air power. They really were talking past each other, but it left deep bitterness. Uh, and the Cuban patriots were cut down on the beach. Nixon, I don't think, would have made that mistake. Nixon would have sent the bombers. So I think there's a fundamental difference right there. Secondarily, though, uh, Nixon is, uh, this is used against him in the 1960 debates because the CIA tips Kennedy that there's a Bay of Pigs uh, operation, you know, a... Uh, an invasion planned, and Kennedy uses it in the debate attacking Nixon for not being sufficiently tough on Cuba, knowing that Nixon cannot say, well, we're supposed to invade any week now, because that's classified information. I'll get to you in one second, sir. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, it's an, uh, I think that he, his relationship with them, once he becomes president, he immediately demands the Bay of Pigs and the JFK assassination records. Helms won't hand them over. Helms has been Johnson's boy. Helms was doing all kinds of dirty work for Johnson. If Nixon had asked Helms to break into the Watergate, he would never have been impeached. If he'd used the FBI, Lyndon Johnson used the FBI to hunt homosexuals on Barry Goldwater's staff. He used the FBI to wiretap Nixon's campaign plan. He can't be prosecuted. That was the government doing that. Nixon's mistake was forming the plumbers an extra legal entity to conduct illegal break-ins and wiretappings. The other presidents had violated civil liberties just as badly, but they'd done it through channels. Another question. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, if I may jump on one thing that was mentioned only in passing. Yes. Uh, and we're thinking here not about so much about what's going on, but what the public knows about. Yes. Is that uh, the Democrats wanted Nixon's psychiatric record. Yes. When in that day, if there had been just the hint that Nixon was undergoing any psychiatric treatment, that could have been ruinous politically. Well, it's even worse than that because John Kennedy um, had health issues of his own. He did, in fact, have Addison's disease. Somebody broke into his doctor's office in New York. Uh, it is interesting to me that the historian, um, 
I believe it is uh, about one historian blames Nixon for this break-in. But it's three weeks later that Lyndon Johnson uses the story at the Democratic National Convention to try to derail Kennedy. The man who broke into Kennedy's office is Lyndon Johnson. He even used the, the files. Now, that causes Robert Kennedy to get Nixon uh, to get Jack Kennedy's two doctors, uh, Dr. Cohen and Dr. Travell, to write letters asserting that he's in perfect health. Those letters are a lie. They're a complete fabrication. But more troubling is the fact that Dr. Travell has written to the president several times saying, stop taking the injections of, Jack, of Dr. Jacobson. He's giving you barbiturates and amphetamines. They're not safe for you. And those are in the records. They, we have now can see these records. So uh, there was enormous concern. And therefore, in a certain sense, I believe Nixon's psychiatric records were sought so you could have a stalemate. You don't talk about my Addison's, and I don't talk about the fact that you're seeing a shrink, which you're absolutely right. In 1960, unlike today, where attitudes are somewhat better, people don't want a president who's seeing a psychiatrist. It would have been taboo. It would have been death. It's interesting, by the way, that the psychiatrist who saw Nixon had another famous client who Nixon recommended to him, a guy named Gerald Ford. Anyway, uh, yes, sir. What, uh, this uh, business about Nixon, requesting the CIA's records about the assassination. Yes. Did Nixon have some kind of a closet, uh, for lack of a better word, sympathy for John F. Kennedy because after what happened, despite all the paranoia? No, I think it was, no, it was self-interest. Self 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 interest. Self interest. He wanted to see whether he was the guy, whether it said in the report that he was the guy who hooked up the mob and, and the CIA. That, it was all self-preservation. Now, Lamar Waldron has written a book, which I'm sure we have here, in which he makes the case that that's what the break-in is about. His book is brilliant and extremely well, run, well written. I don't think he's right about that. Somebody who hasn't asked a question, and then I think we have to. Yes, yes sir. Um, you being the first and only Nixon staff member I've ever met, um, out of my own curiosity, I know it's not necessarily related to Watergate itself, but I was wondering, since you were a staff, were a staff member, what your opinion was on his supposed cutting of all ties of the gold standard? Uh, I identify it in my book as one of the biggest mistakes he made. I think he made three colossal errors. Taking, closing the gold window, wage and price controls, huge mistake, the war on drugs. The war on drugs has been a colossal, expensive failure. It doesn't work. Incarcerating people with drug problems doesn't work. It costs more than rehabilitating them. It is the worst failure uh, uh, and it's a bipartisan failure. Both Republicans and Democrats have made this mistake. Uh, the gold standard, removing us from the gold standard really kicks the props out from the economy and the, and the problems we're having now are directly relatable to the fact that the dollar is not stronger. You want to crush the Soviet Union? A strong dollar. Crush the Soviet Union. You, you, want, to, you want to play oil politics in the Middle East? A strong dollar. It's crucial. All right. Uh, one more time, perhaps, if we have, uh, if we have more, one or two last uh, questions, I'll, anyone, I'll or shall we sign hours, some books? So. Yes, sir. What is your opinion about the, uh, the story that President Johnson had negotiated a truce uh, uh, the Vietnam War at the end of his presidency? Yeah, I'm glad you asked this. Uh, it's unfortunately not that clean. Basically, five days before the election, Johnson decides to, announces that he is going to call a bombing halt, and he's calling for talks with the South Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, but that has to address the question of the NLF uh, and, the, uh, and the Viet Cong, because the, the North insists that they be at the table as if they are separate entities. We won't agree to that. Johnson has no agreement from the South Vietnamese. He has no agreement from the North Vietnamese. Indeed, the Soviet ambassador, Dobrynin, writes in his memoirs, I told Johnson this was a crazy idea that the North Vietnamese had no interest in negotiation, that they wouldn't come to the table. Why Johnson didn't call the bombing halt five months before the election instead of five days before the election has a lot to do with the fact that in the polls, Nixon is stalled and Kennedy and Humphrey is coming on. The Humphrey-Nixon race, folks, is closer than the Nixon-Kennedy race of 1960. People have forgotten that. Nixon is holding on to a thin lead, but he's you know, running out of cards, and Johnson calls the bombing halt. So there's no question that, that people around Nixon uh, enlist Anna Chenault, who was the uh, beautiful Asian millionaire widow of General Claire Chenault, who owned the Tiger, uh, Air, Flying Tigers Airline, who lived in the Watergate, was a major hostess and also the mistress of Senator John Tower. 
And Chennault and Tower basically get the word to the South Vietnamese embassy, don't go to the table in Johnson's proposal. Uh, you know, he doesn't, have, he doesn't have anybody else lined up. The South Vietnamese, I think, are inclined to do that anyway, because they realize Johnson's about to close the door on them. He just wants a quick piece, and he wants to put Humphrey over the top. So they bail out, and the talks uh, collapse. Liberals say, therefore, Nixon is guilty of treason. I say, Johnson's playing politics, and he's wrapping it, he's wrapping it in national security, but he doesn't have a deal, and he knows it. It's just to prop up Humphrey. And in fact, the deflation of the prospects for peace talks rapidly dissipate, and Nixon hangs on to a, to a, a narrow lead. So put another way, the grocer's boy from Yorba Linda outsnookered the man from the Perdinals River, kind of a payback for stealing the presidency from him in 1960. These guys did not like each other. Uh, they, li listen to both their tapes. Sorry, Go ahead. Kissinger is, uh, ironically, just to show you what a weasel Kissinger is, <laughs> he is on the payroll of presidential candidate Nelson Rockefeller as a foreign policy advisor. He is secretly writing foreign policy memos to Vice President Humphrey telling him how to deflate Nixon. At the same time, he's a paid consultant to Johnson's State Department. He gets wind of the bombing hole. He sees an opportunity for Henry the K. He knows Nixon hates him. Nixon hates him because he's been a big critic of Nixon. He's a Rockefeller guy. Nixon and Rockefeller were epic rivals. So what he does is he calls his friend Bill Buckley, the only friend he has in common with Nixon. Buckley calls Nixon and says, guess what? Johnson's going to spring a bombing halt on you five days out. Suddenly, John Mitchell is calling Anna Chennault and Senator Tower, and they're on their way to the South Vietnamese Embassy to scuttle the bombing, the peace initiative. So uh, it's, uh, this is all very detailed in the book. Yes, sir. In regard to the 18 and a half minute gap, yes. did you say that Haldeman said after hearing it there was nothing significant? In no, what I said was if you looked at Haldeman's handwritten notes, he, he was an inveterate note taker. So wh during the calls, he would make notes about the course of the call. There's, and he actually, they're published, they're online, they're extraordinary. Yes, but it's his sense. He's right. Correct, but he has no reason at that juncture. He's transcribing every tape. He doesn't know the tapes will ever be discovered. He's basically taking notes of his con during his conversation. It, you can't take that as, as a fact. In view of the fact that Nixon is already on the tapes, at least sounding like he's ordering the CI, the FBI, to break the uh, the uh, investigation of the CIA. In other words, Nixon has definitely joined the cover-up. That is his giant mistake. When John Dean comes to him on the 13th, it is the first time Dean tells him after knowing for nine months that somebody at the White House is involved and that Gordon Strawn has been getting transcripts of the Watergate bugs. The first time Nixon learns that is on the 13th. Dean tries to shed the attention to the, to the uh, conversation of the 21st when he first says, Mr. President, there's a cancer on the presidency. Haldeman, Ehrlichman are involved. I myself have obstructed justice, his words. Remember, John Dean has got the CIA, pardon me, he's got the FBI and the U.S. Attorney telling him what's going on in the current investigation of the Watergate break-in so the cover-up can stay one step ahead of the government. So uh, I guess my point is, since Nixon has already killed himself a dozen other places in the tapes, why erase that one section? What could he say that would have been worse than what he has already said? He could be clearly, his biggest mistake is joining the cover-up. He obstructs justice. It's what brings him down. And of course, he gets a pardon because he knows that he, uh, Vice President Agnew has moved out of the way. He pleads to a minor tax evasion. He would never have pardoned Nixon. They make Gerald Ford president because Nixon knows that Gerald Ford in 19, in 1963, as a member of the Warren Commission, that Ford has changed in his own handwriting the, in the, the autopsy document of John Kennedy, changing the description of the wound from his upper back to his lower neck to accommodate the single bullet theory. Reported in the New York Times, the, the autopsy is declassified by the American, uh, by the uh, Assassinations Review Board, reported in AP. It's Ford's indelible handwriting. Nixon knows this in real time. So Nixon sends uh, Al Haig, according to two witnesses, to tell Ford, look, Ford, look, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, August 1st, 1974, if Nixon's going down, he's taking everybody with him. The agency, you, the, the Warren Commission, the Bay of Pigs, 
it's all, it all comes out if Nixon stands in the dock. I think he, this is how he secures his pardon. And the pardon saves him from prosecution, saves him from prison, and puts him in a position to launch his greatest comeback of all, becoming a foreign policy advisor of, of, uh, of Bill Clinton. It is Clinton who says at Nixon's funeral, let the days of judging Richard Nixon on anything other than his entire record be over. So let me wrap this up by saying this. Most of you know I have a tattoo of Nixon on my back, about the size of a grapefruit. It's in the middle of my back. It's, you can see it at the, at the back of the book when you buy a book. And we'll even show it to you if you don't, I guess. Uh, and it's not an ideological statement. It's a, it, it simply says this, that in life, when things don't go your way, when you suffer defeats, when you suffer setbacks, when things seem futile, when, you're, when, you're, when you doubt, you have an obligation to get yourself up Dust yourself off and get back in the game. The story of Nixon's a story of tenacity and persistence and focus and discipline. It, it is a man who, who in 1962 flames out of the race for governor and only six years later is sworn in as president of the United States, who famously says you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore. So it's a story about resilience. That's what impresses me about Nixon. It's not ideological. He had no ideology. He was a pragmatist. He had conservative views and liberal views. He had a very progressive government by today's standards. He couldn't get nominated in today's Republican Party. So that is the story. Thank you very much for coming, and please come get a book. Thank you, Roger. All right, folks, a quick reminder for our internet audience watching at home, there's still time to call the number on your screen, get a copy of the book, we'll get it signed, and we'll ship it to wherever you are in the US free of charge. Also, a reminder that all of our live stream events are archived, so if you don't get to watch it live, you can go to the Books and Books website, and um, all the events will be saved there for you to watch at your convenience. For those of you here in the house, we have Nixon's Secrets, as well as uh, Mr. Stone's previous book, the bestseller, The Man Who Killed Kennedy, uh, for sale at the counter. He'll be signing over here at the table to the left of the podium. Thanks very much. Thank you.